Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Nourish uh, panel discussion, Restaurant Babies, with our curatorial assistant, Maria Pallad, exhibiting artist Jane Wong, writer Eddie Kim, and artist Tom Su. My name is Kathy Tykolis. I'm the Richmond Art Gallery's Education and Public Programs Coordinator, and I'm here just to introduce the Nourish programming and give you some tips on using the Zoom format in case you have not been using it in the past two years. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank you, anyone out there who's joining us um, and from wherever you're zooming in from and supporting the Richmond Art Gallery's programs. Um, I wanted you to know this is just one in a whole series of online talks and events that we are offering during the Nourish exhibition, which runs until April 3rd, 2022. And this is all thanks to the Richmond Has Heart program. So please visit our website and social media platforms to see what else we have happening uh, during this exhibition. So with all the housekeeping out of the way, um, I would like to introduce our moderator and our host today, Maria Pallad. She is the gallery's curatorial assistant, and um, she's been with us at the gallery for quite a few years in different roles. But when I heard that she grew up in her family's business, which was a store in the Philippines, I thought she'd be the ideal person to host. Um, she'll have a lot of stories very similar to our panelists today. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Maria to take over. I'm going to disappear into the background to monitor your questions. Um, again, please send them throughout. Don't wait for the end to send in your questions. Um, so thank you everyone for coming today and I'll see you later. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to those joining us today for those who are registered, logged in, and are here today with us. And good afternoon to our panelists. Like Kathy said, my name is Maria Filipina Pallad, uh, Curatorial Assistant at Richmond Art Gallery. And I will be moderating today's event, Restaurant Babies Nourish Panel Discussion. The idea behind today's topic was conceived by Jane Wong who is part of today's panel. In fact, she spoke about her experience growing up in the world of restaurants during her recent Todd Pot Talks guesting. In this panel discussion, we'll be speaking with three restaurant babies, poet and artist Jane Wong, poet and business owner, Eddie Kim, and artist Tom Su. Jane, Eddie, and Tom all came from families who started restaurants in the countries they chose to settle as immigrants. This exchange of meaningful stories will give us a peek into the lives of immigrant children growing up in the world of food and service. Family-owned restaurants, cafes, and stores, which helped the, shape the culture of communities in which they are embedded, gave and are still giving bright futures to generations of immigrant families. Now I'd like to, I'm so excited to welcome today's panelists. Tom Su, based in Vancouver, is a visual artist whose work seeks to investigate the curious condition of spaces and their correlation to the bodies that attend them. He comes from a base in, an, in analog photography, and this stability shows, allows him to extend into made, found, and choreographic sculpture, all of which deal with the everyday mundane. He currently lives and works in Vancouver and holds a BFA in photography from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Tom's family opened a cafe in Richmond called Leisure Tea and Coffee in 1996. Tom undertook a residency at Burrard Arts Foundation in the spring of 2018. He has exhibited Libby Lush Gold Gallery, Center A, Macaulay Fine Art, Gallery TPW, Yaktak Gallery, Unit Pit, and Index Gallery. Welcome, Tom. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Now, Eddie Kim received his MFA in, in Poetry from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's a Kundiman Fellow from Seattle. His poems have appeared in Poetry Northwest, The Margins, The Collages, Now the Rupture, Pinwheel, Lantern Review, South Dakota Review, and others. His work has been nominated for Best of the Net, and his poem, Telephone of the Wind, was featured on Tracy K. Smith's show, The Slowdown. Eddie also owns Gomo Kimchi, a business based out of Glasgow, Scotland, which sells kimchi derived from a well-loved family recipe. Thanks for joining us today from Glasgow, Eddie. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> 
And of course, we have Jane Wong. Jane is the author of How Not to Be Afraid of Everything from Alice James Books and Overpour from Action Books. She holds an MFA in poetry from the University of Iowa and a PhD in English from the University of Washington and is an associate professor of creative writing at Western Washington University. She is currently exhibiting at the Richmond Art Gallery's Nourish, which runs until April 3rd. Welcome, Jane. Thanks, Maria. I'm so excited to be here with Tom and Eddie. Can't wait to talk about a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, on a personal note, I also grew up in the food and retail industry. My mother owned Christine's, a small grocery store in my hometown of San Pedro in the Philippines. And so I'm happy to be part of today's discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to also mention that Jane will be leading the first part of the conversation, but I'll be asking the first question and then Jane will take over. My first question to everyone is, what was it like growing up in the restaurant business? How about we start with Eddie? Hello, thank you, Maria. Um, so yeah, my name is Eddie Kim. I'm a poet and a restaurant baby. Um, my family owned three different restaurants while I was growing up and uh, throughout different stages of my childhood. Um, and I feel like each one kind of informed my life in different ways. Um, and, but in the, in in a weird way for me in a lot of ways it felt very normal like growing up in that setting because I feel like the community the Korean community that I grew up in was surrounded by a bunch of entrepreneurs and different types of uh, business people people who own their own businesses and and so it, it didn't seem that strange to me that you know that we would go there after school just straight there from school and you know spend the day there and and sometimes I wasn't even the only kid there um, and so it was like, there was a lot to explore. There was a lot to experience. There were so many different kind of sensory experiences to have, particularly in a restaurant, the sounds, the smells. Um, and so it was a very kind of engaging way to grow up, I feel. And, um, and it was really kind of, it felt like a new adventure, but like a normal everyday thing. And then, um, and, and I would say for me that it like not a lot of people really knew what my parents did. And so the only people that knew were the people kind of within my immediate community. Um, and so I didn't, um, there wasn't like a sense of feeling all that different at that time. Um, it wasn't until like later that I, that I started to feel those things and understand those things a lot better. Um, but um, like the, the it's like the restaurant life kind of definitely shaped me in the sense that like the my parents second restaurant got burned down and arsoned and that kind of shaped the way the path that my life took because we moved to Alaska after that because we we're on the verge of bankruptcy um and so they had to switch on the fly um and so I I loved I like I feel like it's a, it's a very proud thing for me to to be a restaurant baby um and so I'm really excited to hear what everyone else has to say, because I haven't really had an opportunity to talk about this a lot with, and especially in this way. I'm like, I've talked about it with, with Jane a couple of times here and there, but, um, but it is something that I feel um, is a really interesting thing to, to kind of, because there's so many of us. How about you, Tom? What was it like? Um, I, I, so I grew up in Taiwan and, my grandfather has like a shave ice place and next door was my aunt's breakfast place. So growing up, we were always, we lived on this street that was just filled with like little stores and restaurants and stuff like that. It's like the food street. Um, so everywhere we went, it was like, there's food everywhere. And you really notice like the community that they kind of share, everyone kind of watches out for each other. Um, and then my parents then opened a little, a uh, coffee shop not on the street but away from the street so they that was their like moving out from their family kind of thing and started their own thing um so growing up I was always kind of surrounded by restaurants and to me it just felt like another home it didn't feel like a restaurant it just felt like another room that I would do my homework in or like or like wait for my parents or something like that 
Um, and that to me felt some sort of, like not exclusive or anything like that, but it, it just felt like it didn't, yeah, it didn't feel like a restaurant restaurant. But when I go to other restaurants, I felt kind of like, I respect the space in a sense, like I understand it's, it's a running business. So how we, how I see restaurant and how I'm, how I'm in my, our own family restaurant and others, you kind of like play this double role of inside house, inside house and outside house kind of thing. Um, but again, like there's so much memories and like things we hold on to that um, I don't notice when growing up, but now like meeting other restaurant babies, like, oh, you felt the same way too. So there's a lot of discussions like that that I'm excited to share and ongoing with um, Eddie and Jane and everyone, yeah. Thanks, Tom. I, I definitely felt the same way. Having grown up in a store that's just an extension of our family home. It's like in the morning and you want a piece of bread for breakfast, you can actually go into the store and get some bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Jane? Yeah, I love all this conversation starting and I'm, I'm sure there's there's so much to kind of keep talking about. Um, so thank you all for, for sharing. Uh, how how growing up in a restaurant is so tied to, I think, like uh, memory and community and um, that it really changes, like Eddie was talking about moving to Alaska, like it, it also um, can pivot one towards like a whole different trajectory. And I think about that too, um, growing up in a Chinese American takeout restaurant um, on the Jersey Shore in a strip mall, um, you know, that particular restaurant was my father's and, you know, I spent all of my time there, you know, restaurant life is late um, in the evening, uh, we would pretty much pack up and go home around, you know, midnight. Um, and I, you know, became friends as Tom was talking about all the kind of other stores and shops, like around the strip mall. Uh, I hung out with adults a lot, I realize now, because um, I, I guess it was, we were the only restaurant babies in the strip mall. And so I, I knew like the pizzeria next door, um, the laundromat, the candy store, um, you know, Burlington Coat Factory. I can see the strip mall so deeply in my mind. Um, you know, and I think a lot of growing up in a restaurant was, as Eddie was saying, being surrounded by sens sensory details, like the, the smell of food, the, the walk, making that sizzling sounds, like everything was almost like synesthesia, um, which I think led to, to kind of um, the fact that we're also all artists here. And I think that there is so much um, creativity, I think, when you are growing up in a space that is um, at, at any time full of potential and adventure and possibility of new customers coming by of, you know, little little things if like someone runs out of like rice or ice, like the kind of dance of trying to find, like it was, it was magical. And I think, I think Eddie said like everyday adventures, like that's how it felt to me, I think growing up um, in the restaurant. Um, I will also say too, you know, um, I think that growing up in a restaurant was really kind of um, a place in which I realized um, as a kid that, you know, the labor of my parents were so, it was so apparent to me. Like I, as much as I wanted to be a kid and play around and just, you know, use the, the strip mall and the restaurant as my playground, which I did, you know, um, you know, when I was being a brat, I would throw like an egg in the parking lot and hit a car, you know. <laughs> um, but then realizing like how much labor my parents put into the restaurant um, and how much that, you know, cost, right, that one egg that I threw and what a waste that was. Like I was always very aware. It also made me very mature, I think, to to grow up in this way, to be very aware of my, my parents' labor. Um, and also, you know, my, my father was a gambler and, you know, ultimately the, the restaurant failed um, due to money um, and kind of like his gambling addiction. And so I think about that, like I think about how precarious restaurant life is too, um, as much as it, is, as it was magical and fun, there's always these layers, I think, there. Um, but yeah, no, I really appreciate kind of having this opportunity could, could, to share our stories because I, I really do think that you know, as Eddie was saying, there's so many restaurant babies out there and you see, you can notice them. 
um, you know, working at the restaurant, their family restaurants or businesses, as Maria is mentioning, you know, about the kind of taking the bread off the, the shelf and that, you know, it's so different than kind of any other kind of way of, of growing up. Um, and I, I guess like maybe that leads to um, kind of opening up the discussion a bit more. Um, and I'd love to hear um, from Eddie and Tom in terms of what kind of day to day, what was an average day? And again, I'm, it's funny because I just said like, you know, everyday adventures. So an average day may not be average whatsoever. Um, I'm just curious, what was it like um, on the day to day or like how was your routine different from your other kind of peers growing up, um, you know, in secondary school, for instance, like what was, what was different about kind of being at the restaurant, um, if you have any stories, um, and maybe I'll ping pong it back to, to Tom and then Eddie, if you want to chime in, and maybe it could be a little, feel free to, you know, bounce back and forth. We don't have to be so like formal about like, now it's Eddie. <laughs> So chime in whenever, and Maria too, if you if you also have uh, memories too, and thinking about yeah that average day, like how was it different from, you know, your peers growing up? I remember just like I think we discussed this earlier on saying how like our eating time is always kind of different <laughs> with with everyone else's because we're not eating when everyone's eating, so we always have a late lunch or like a late dinner or something or an early dinner so that it doesn't interfere with the restaurant hours. So that to me was always kind of like, e eating was like a, a thing not to do in the regular time. So that was like interesting compared to other people too. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, very late dinners. Like that's <laughs> what I really remember is like 9 p.m dinners and most kids I didn't it was a shock to me that apparently some children go to sleep at 7 p.m yeah. <laughs> like I was like what like are you kidding me like that's like that's not anyway I don't know Eddie if you want to jump into yeah, well, yeah um well not just the different times but also like for me it was like different settings in which I would eat I would be eating like so for me when when I was really little uh for my parents first restaurant they had um it was really tiny. It was a really small spot. And so I would eat with my brother in the back seat of the car with the, um, with the, it was a hatchback. So it has that little kind of weird, like cover thing that was kind of just the right height for, um, for my brother and I to eat. And so we'd be in the back seat, you know, pretending it was a spaceship or something like that and playing games with our, with our cousin, um uh, who was watching over us um because I was like six years old or you know seven years old or something at the time and eating lunch back there um and I like and I always thought it was you know great fun you know it was like kind of like a movable fork <laughs> you know, that, that, that went around with you yeah I love that kind of um I guess the that goes back to that kind of daily imagination I think kind of um, yeah, and kind of it becomes uh, a routine or becomes something like what other kids don't do this, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things my brother and I always we played this game, which again, like was very kind of quote unquote normal to me, but I guess other kids never played this game, maybe except for restaurant babies, uh, which is the game of lock you in the meat freezer. <laughs> and you, you know, meat freezers are like, it, there's only one way to open it. You can't open it from inside. And so we would just play this game of trying to trap each other in the meat freezer and how long you could last like in the cold, um, which was so fun for us, but also like, I don't think if I, if I didn't grow up in a restaurant, I would have never played that game. Like it just seemed like, you know, just something natural that, that we did. Um, and that's just kind of, you know, that was our kind of playtime. Like there was, there was always playtime, but there was also chores. Like I, I did have to do tons of, of chores. And, you know, some of my chores included, you know, cleaning off the poop vein or what, whatever you want to call it <laughs> of the shrimp. And I distinctly remember having like a wet paper towel and just like with my like knife and just like slicking it. And it's just like this pile of goop. And um, I'm curious uh, what chores you had to do. We had um, like an Americana restaurant, and so um, I remember I would uh, do a lot of the cheese grating. 
So my, my uncle who came up initially with us um, to Alaska, he would chop up, like we'd get these big, like kind of, I mean, like industrial sized blocks of cheese. They were massive. Um, and, and so he would chop them up for me and I would just sit there and grate the cheese into these giant bins <laughs> for them. Um, and, uh, and so it was like, that was like the extent, most of the extent, and occasionally I would make milkshakes. Um, but mostly that wasn't really so much a chore as just a way for me to drink milkshakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I was like, oh. So look, there's a milkshake. I'll do it. I got it. <laughs> you know. Oh my um, god, that cracks me up. No problem. That's my favorite. So. <laughs> How about you, Tom? My mom would always tell the story where back in the days when you could smoke inside, um, I would wait till the person like finished the cigarette or like ashes a little bit, and I would just run up to them and just exchange the the, the ashtray. And then I don't, and she was like, "Yeah, you always do that for some reason." And I was like, "That's the thing to do, I guess." And it was wild to think that you could smoke inside before too. That's like a mind blowing thing. Yeah, I was, yeah, that is kind of mind blowing. It's funny that, so that was your choice. Like that was your, like you chosen. Yeah, I was excited. I love that. I was excited to like serve people in that sense. Being like, let me help you with this. With your oh, ashtray. But let me like get, get you in your ashtray kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and then afterwards, like when I was 15, we, we started working at the cafe as like, actual employees and stuff like that. Me and my brother and sister, we all took turns like working there once we turned 15. Um, mm. So we learned a lot of things that like to wash dishes. We start by washing dishes, obviously. And then later we like shadow people outside and just like learn to like recognize the, the objects that people were making so that they could communicate better. Because once you know what you're serving, then that yeah, makes things easier, I guess. Yeah, that's, I wonder, I feel like if, uh, because um, our restaurant, you know, it didn't last for a long time. Like, I wonder as like a, a late teen or even my 20s, like how how it would have been totally different, like type of chore or like learning actually how to work there. Um, yeah, I love that. I will also uh, give a shout out. I think my brother is here. Hi, Steven. Um, who obviously is a restaurant baby. <laughs> and I love too in the chat that he's saying, um, Jane always won the meat freezer <laughs> game. <laughs> That's because I was bigger, okay? Like I, I will have to admit that. That's totally um, just because I was I was bigger <laughs> and stronger at the time. Um, I, I think I would love to, to pivot to a question. And I kind of mentioned this a, a little bit when I was kind of introducing, um, I guess my, my restaurant experience, but um, I'd love it if you uh, could touch on kind of what, you know, the kind of restaurant life was like in terms of how it shaped your ideas about labor in particular, and just like how aware of, you know, labor you were as a kid, or even thinking about um, your labor now, right, and what you do now. I'm curious, just kind of if, if any of you want to talk about um, how, yeah, growing up in the restaurant shaped your ideas about labor. Um, I, 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 well, I actually, I, I, I feel like it definitely shaped my views on labor profoundly. Um, I was, there was like, you know, you know, those scenes in like TV shows and movies where, you know, the kids are always kind of sad about the parent, you know, not being able to make their whatever school event, you know, whether it's a recital mm -hmm. or I never, ever once felt that way. Um, like not like never once because I was just my parents are working and <laughs> it was and it just didn't seem to me like uh like I I didn't feel like hurt by their by their lack of presence there but I mean they did still try to be present and they still were and like my dad was a he was a smoker for a long time and he had a very distinct cough and the way that my brother and I have talked about this the way that you could tell that he was he actually made it to your basketball game or, or whatever school function you were doing, as you could hear him occasionally cough and, and um, and so for 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 me like that in that way I I like my th views on labor are, are very kind of I have a very kind of distinct memory of thinking of it from an early from an early age, but then also um, I think about it in terms of 
because uh, like my dad never finished college and stuff so for him I think he felt like and I've heard other kind of immigrants talk about this where like they had to work with their bodies right like they, they mm-hmm. didn't have a kind of other options so when they went to a different country whether it was the U.S. or Canada or like I have family in Germany and stuff would they a lot of times had to work with their bodies um and and so it's I feel like it's something that and I feel like that definitely leads to that next generation we don't want you to have to work with your bodies um and so for me especially now when I'm like I'm starting like I've started this kimchi business and trying to and I'm definitely it's a very taxing you know uh practice and and so my you know I'll talk about it with my mom all the time and she's like you know, maybe for now it's okay, but then later you should do stuff with your body, <laughs> and and um, because it's so hard to work with your body throughout, and and I think about that in terms of people who don't have that option, who don't, and and the people who who choose that option to you know to work with their bodies, and it's a very very difficult kind of path. Yeah, I think there is definitely a lot of invisible labors that happens in a restaurant. Once a restaurant closes, it, it's not done it's still it's still working <laughs> so my mom and I, I agree as well my mom said the same thing where she would tell me saying try not to f- do things with your hands like when you grow up like try not to work with your hands that much because use your mind or something because they, they didn't grow up I don't think they finished um, high school or anything like that so they they were always physically working um but I don't know I think there's you appreciate that when you make things on your own with your hands too because you do learn something from all the labor too definitely I think yeah that was very similar again as Tom was mentioning it's so it feels so good to kind of be around restaurant babies and I see my brother saying memories flooding in which is really (laughs) sweet in the chat because it is oh oh I think my brother's uh, replying only to panelists so I don't think he can Stephen, apply, go to panelists and attendees <laughs> in the chat um, so people can see your awesome comments. Um, but my brother is saying like memories flooding in and it, it's really great to hear, you know, our shared experience as restaurant babies in this way, because I think similarly, right, that like my mom and dad, you know, especially when my mom was like, get out of the kitchen, like, even though it was funny because she was like also do this these chores and I was like huh and so she was like making me use my hands to do work for the restaurant but she was also like but but don't use your hands and and go to study and go to school and you know uh you know also you know my family um you know are also you know didn't graduate didn't finish high school or kind of I'm first gen to go to college and I think that there was always this kind of pressure to to not kind of be in the restaurant industry or to to work with my hands and body you know and I think that I could see like my mom's hands like they are the hands of a restaurant worker and um, she's a postal worker as well and they are you know they're strong um, and they can crush cockroaches. Like, you know, like just bam, I distinctly remember that. It's just like, yo, that's restaurant life. There's just, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just, it's a difficult, it's always like, there's always also this feeling like something at any point can, um, like disaster can strike. And so even thinking about having an infestation or, you know, a bill was sent the wrong time, like everything was always precarious. And I think I was also aware of that labor too, like not just the physical labor of showing up to work and and cooking and those long hours. And after one closes the restaurant, as Tom was mentioning, there's still more work after that. Um, But there was also the work, I think, of, of what it meant to it for for it to be always precarious like was it going to be a good year was it not going to be a good year and I think my mom really wanted me to like be in a job later in life that didn't have that precarity that I could just be like you have a stable job like this is you know um labor that is of your mind etc and so it's funny though because a lot of it is muscle memory of those chores like I I feel a little bit of shamed almost because I I don't like do this type of work now like if that makes any sense to to any of you but I, I feel kind of and maybe for you Eddie since you are kind of almost like returning to I guess your your kind of cooking root like you know roots that there's a lot of pride in that and I, I feel so like 
as a professor, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know that that in, in some ways my mom's dream has come true of me like using my mind of sorts, but I also feel really shameful that I I don't I I, I don't do that that labor that I know that I come from. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to add to to that, but I, I think that it's such a yeah, I think it's comp complicated, I think, in think in thinking about labor. Yeah, well, I think like what like what Tom was talking about, there is that there's that visceral satisfaction that you get from accomplishing something with your hands. Mm. All right. And and I think that I don't know, for for me it's like a tricky thing. And I like it's something that I'm trying to figure out a way to to find a balance between the two to kind of be able to do some like physical work where I'm like creating like a, a product type thing, um, where I have that satisfaction satisfaction from that but not doing it to the point where I completely burn myself out and like have to kind of cut out other aspects because I mean like you said like a restaurant like a restaurant is full time there's like mm -hmm. there's really no like even if you're only open for like maybe six eight hours during the day you're still working like a good other six hours on top of that um and so it's try it's tricky trying to find that balance i think and 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 for me because i like to do both i like to do things with my mind obviously and i like to do things like uh, the physical active things and so it's trying to find that balance but it's very difficult i think yeah and i would i wonder too um which maybe leads into another question um like what was it like i think like for um, I wonder uh, on, I guess, your family side, but also like our side of what it was like to kind of also raise kids this way. I think about like, even thinking about times when I was being like a bad kid and like when I threw that egg in the parking lot or um, my brother and I would get in trouble all the time for doing things. Um, and like most kids grow up in a place where they're just like, go to your room or they get grounded or whatever. And my mom would basically ground us in the restaurant bathroom. And because, you know, and she'll close the door and then um, we'd have to stay there um, and think about what we did. But then like all the customers would try to use the bathroom and she would always be like, ignore her. <laughs> Don't worry about Jane like just tell her to get out and then you go pee and then you tell her to go back in and then close the door and lock her, like leave her there. And they're probably like, they open the door and there's just this like furious, angry little like Chinese baby, you know, just being like, Ugh. you know? So I'd be curious, like what was, you know, like did your parents talk about what it was like to raise you both in the space or if you have funny stories or it's just stories about like being raised in this space or, I'm curious, yeah. When my parents opened the cafe in Taiwan, they, um, I, I, I was just born. Well, no, I wasn't just born. I, I was like maybe three or something or four. And then they sent me to, away to like a homestay in Singapore. And then they also sent my brother to the neighbor down the street. And they tried to send my sister <laughs> to like, to another friend to like help take care of when they're busy. Um, but then she got returned, so then she got to stick with them for a long time. So I think they're always like trying to like look for help too. And I, growing up, I don't like 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 I said, I didn't really feel abandoned. We kind of just make our own world and try to enjoy it. And I remember, yeah, my parents would leave us alone. when we immigrated here. Our parents would leave us alone, home alone sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, that's a bad thing that they're doing. <laughs> We're not allowed to do this in Canada. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, we like kind of just had each other and just made our own board and just enjoyed it. So, cause I, I also noticed they need to socialize too. Cause my, my mom moved here when she was 29 and with three kids. And now I'm like, how does, how does that happen? Um, so it was like, they're working so much, but then they also need to like socialize and make friends here and there. So when they left me home, home alone, it's like, it's fine. It's like, they have socializing to do too. Yeah, that was the same for me. I, I was, we, yeah, we were definitely left home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or it's just, like the, or the just exactly, exactly. <laughs> or like read chapters or something and like read books. <laughs> right. I was like, also like the 80s, it was a little more. <laughs> like, <laughs> 
yeah what about you eddie well like it was like yeah similar like i mean i think we we all lived kind of like close to each other so like my aunt had a house like right down the road we had family friends that were also like just across the street and so there was like a little community of like friends and they all kind of like worked around each other sort of um and and so when i would get home there's there was no I, like i can remember feeling like there wasn't always a guarantee that that someone would be home by the time i got home from school mm -hmm. um and so sometimes just and it wasn't like like oh are they ever gonna come it's just it's just you know they would come you know it was like traffic or they just got out of the lunch you know Brit or the lunch hour went late or whatever and so I would just kind of pop over to the you know the friend's house or to my aunt's house and and just wait and it wasn't that, that big a deal with like, it in terms of like punishments and stuff um it sounds I, so harsh it just sounds like in terms of punishments <laughs> But I remember specifically my mom punishing me doing like the the physical, you know, you know, like um, the stress positions um, while while like she was in the kitchen doing something, and she's like, uh, like I can't really discipline you right now, so you just stand over there with your hands up. Funnily enough, I don't really remember my brother doing it. I think, <laughs> I, I, think I was just kind of. I was a little bit rambunctious as a kid and there was just so much stuff to kind of get in trouble with you know there's so many different weird like things that when you're a kid you're just like oh look like the tons of gigantic cardboard boxes that you can slide around on or build into a house or something and and um and there's lots of dangerous things too that that i feel like i kind of messed around with that you know <laughs> like these days like you like you said people would look at and be like that is a little irresponsible but at the time it didn't seem like a weird thing and it was just kind of fun yeah i love that too because uh i definitely uh, as someone who was kind of uh watching my little brother uh, i definitely would get in trouble on his behalf um because you know that's just what happens i think but i i, I do i'm curious too maybe as a uh, kind of follow up too, because I feel like we're now heading into like us being um, troublemakers of sorts. Um, what are some fun stories of like things you did that maybe, uh, you know, got you in trouble? Well, not got you in trouble, but like just some of that kind of, um, I don't know, as Tom was talking about like games you play, just things you did to kind of pass the time or um, cause trouble or, or whatnot. I keep, uh, of course, the meat freezer game was one of those for me. Um, but, you know, uh, other times, like, you know, my brother and I, you know, we were bored. I mean, that's the other thing is like a restaurant can be boring. Like it can be, there's not, you know, I, mean, I didn't have a TV, TV, there weren't toys. Like I just kind of had to make things up. And one of the biggest things, obviously, if you're surrounded by food, like I wanted to play with food like that was like my my thing and so I would often try to steal food and I remember I made a styrofoam uh, puppy um, basically out of paper cups and I would make its little head and then I cut out a little mouth and I would like feed it like I, it would be living in the back of the, the restaurant this like styrofoam puppy and I would feed it rice like during like meal time and then you know my family found out that I was like basically wasting food into a styrofoam dog and I got in so much trouble but at the same time it's like what am I what was I supposed to do I was so bored I didn't have toys like you know stuff like that or um you know I, I think about we played uh in the back area of the restaurant a lot and that was right on the train tracks again quite dangerous you know kids just like roaming what as trains go by you know and my brother and I would just like play in this sand pit which now thinking back I'm like what was that I don't think it was sand like I just I'm just thinking to myself why would there be a random sand pit in the back of a strip mall so I'm thinking like oh we don't I don't know what we played with necessarily um but it was always slightly dangerous slightly but it's so fun because like again I think like we weren't under adult supervision um so I don't know if there's something like that Tom <laughs> Um, I remember when we had the cafe in Taiwan, we like lived 
next or, or like living space was next to the cafe so I remember one time I like wanted to look for my parents and they were just missing and I was out of shower and I just literally ran outside and ran into the cafe all naked and just like <laughs> <laughs> and then and again it's like to me that is also just like it's another home so I was I thought I was fine but shouldn't be doing that I guess <laughs> and they would also like I remember I would also it's not really something in trouble but then something I would do was like I, they would buy me lots of VHS movies to keep me busy I guess so I would play like the Little Mermaid like three times a day in different times to pretend I own a movie theater <laughs> so little, like, <laughs> things like that and I don't know try to charge people for things but <laughs> just things to keep me occupied I guess yeah yeah gotta fight the boredom at the restaurant nowadays kids have ipads and things but go ahead Eddie. It, it's it's like a weird thing i don't know if it was the same for you but for me the bore the most boring times were when the restaurant was busiest mm. because for me that's when i wasn't really allowed to to kind of roam free mm. um so because if it was if it was dead then they're like you know whatever if you're walking around that's not a big deal but there were times when it was really busy and I would come down and, and they're like, go back upstairs, it's too busy right now. <laughs> like, and, um, but I, I actually had a similar thing where I, um, I, I remember I was, because of that, that extension of home, we actually lived in the restaurant when we were in Alaska um, and in the upstairs. And so I remember one time I was, I didn't even think about it. I went down to get something and I realized while I was about halfway through in the middle of the restaurant that I was just wearing like long underwear and, and, and like and, and a t-shirt. I was like, I did, hadn't put my like my my pants back on because we were in Alaska. So I just I, I saw I was just walking around and, I, and then you know there was like you know kids from my class having dinner with their parents there. And I just really remember looking around like just utterly mortified. I just oh my god I don't, like, I don't even know what to do at this point do I run up because then it just draws attention to me and um but but the game I, the games that we played weren't we would like because we were in Alaska like especially when I was older we were in Alaska like we would like build snow tunnels on, like on the side of the building and just kind of play like you said around and there was like a weird kind of unused propane tank that we built a fort around um and like and just kind of weird like little things that we would just use to build stuff and um and play around and like I do remember playing like a weird ice bucket game with one of my cousins who was working there at the time and it was just whoever could keep their arm <laughs> in a bucket of ice the longest <laughs> and I, I like and I don't I don't even know if this was a regular game I think this happened maybe once and he was just he just wanted to see how long I would be I would try to keep my arm in there because I was very determined to beat him and so like I think his arm was in there for like 30 seconds like oh that's cold and then I was like I'm gonna be in here forever and I was just <laughs> sitting there with my arm in a bucket of ice for like a minute or two <laughs> Oh my gosh, that reminds me of the meat freezer. See, there are these like <laughs> yeah. weird connections. I was, yeah. yeah, I was thinking of that because we didn't have a meat freezer, but we played the ice bucket game. <laughs> we had the Interest storage. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Tom. We had the storage like section that we would lock ourselves in or something. Okay. <laughs> so there's, there's, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that that's almost more magical than I think, like, because what my, you know, my friends were at home, you know, like, they had, they had, to they had things to play with and, and do, they didn't need an ice bucket game per, per se, and so I think that there's something kind of, um, I don't know, magical and very creative, and, and, and that's maybe why we're kind of artists and, and writers and creators. Um, I will say, too, my, my brother is um, in, in the chat for the panelists, um, is saying, Jane, remember, Remember how we didn't have video games and so we made them from takeout menus where we cut out a little character out of paper to move them and it's true we I, we actually made uh, levels like we drew out levels and we would pretend to play each other's video games and we had like a paper controller because we didn't have we didn't have that and we knew that people were playing these games at like school or whatever uh, but just like just like doing that like just like making stuff up on the fly like I think I don't know if I would have been a poet if it wasn't for the restaurant and I think about that question all the time like what about growing up in the restaurant um 
led to your to your creativity to to being an artist to being a poet um I don't know if anyone wants to answer that question but like what's the link here because I, I feel like I feel like there is a link to me um so yeah oh yeah and I see in the chat too if you want to jump in too Maria yeah well that that's that's all interesting because you guys were talking about um, the idea of play in restaurants. Um, the, my idea of play in the store is with my brother and we'd go to the storage room where all the um, stacks of rice and the stacks of boxes, cigarette boxes would be there. So we'd just go around, go up and down. And it seemed like for us, that was, um, I don't know, it almost felt like um, a hillside or um, almost sometimes like a war zone, my brother would hide and pretend he has a gun. And also we had liquid petroleum gas in there right next to a series of boxes of cigarettes. And now I look back and think <laughs> this was a danger zone, but we didn't realize that because, you know, you had flammable stuff next to um, combustibles. And um, to us, it wasn't, it wasn't fearful. It was a magic place that we could just create environment so yeah that was that was that was one of my funnest memories is turning um really uh drab place into something more man magical mm -hmm. i love that emphasis on magic and i think that you know always will stay with me i feel like uh it is in in my memory it's always going to be magical like i don't regardless of how difficult I know it was to run the restaurant, I think it always, to me, will be magical, even though my mom does not think it's magical. Um, <laughs> and maybe our parents don't think of it that way, but I think growing up in it, it is, it is pure magic. Were there like characters at, uh, you know, like regulars who would come? Mm -hmm. and, like, because I've definitely growing up, there were there were characters like there were like I mean because especially when I was in Alaska because we were in a very small town um there's like 30 miles above the Arctic Circle and so there's like 3,000 people there so you know you get to see the same people over and over again so there was you know definitely like characters there there I remember there's this one like big German um auto mechanic who looked like Santa Claus and you know he would just walk in and be like hello there <laughs> and, and and he would always have like a chili burger with two patties and he would clean his entire plate it was just like everything gone including the orange rind from the garnish ow <laughs> oh i love but that I, question I, about regulars uh <laughs> i don't know tom or maria if you have regular repeat customers that characters that stick out to you Definitely, yeah, and you start making up stories in the beginning, yeah. like, and then later you start to get to know them. You're like, oh, okay, and and they always order the same thing, mm -hmm. and when they don't, you kind of got questions like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. So, like, <laughs> in that sense, like, who becomes that communication of like asking them, are you okay? Because like, not asking them, are you okay, but that's like the question you think, like, if you're not ordering your regular thing, then are you testing something new? Are you? So that is kind of interesting how food trends becomes a language in the restaurant where regulars order regular things or not mm. but i don't know how it's distracting and i think that curious i think that curiosity definitely lends itself to like art yeah you know, and that searching and i feel like to circle back to what you were talking you were asking about earlier jane like i do feel like that that kind of world building almost um at least and like and that curiosity about how other people are living their lives how are other people getting through their day-to-day -day stuff. Um, I think that is something that is definitely for me continued through on throughout. Mm -hmm. And and you know, that, that I think of just you know riding on the bus, you know, or or whatever. And like, and it's that kind of exploration and how you want to try to interact with the world. You're always kind of the, um, sorry, Tom. Oh, no, go ahead. Ahead. Sorry. No, it's just uh, a little bit of a time check right now. It's uh, five to two o'clock. So if our panelists have any questions they'd like, if our attendees have any questions to our panelists, uh, feel free to uh, post them in chat and uh, we can read them out so that the panelists can have a chance to answer them. I do have a question, which is quite interesting. It's, it's I feel like it, it's, it ties to everyone in, in the panel. And I've heard a very 
kind of almost tender thought or, or, or addressed about uh, mothers in this case. It's as if mm. the common uh, thread in, in the, our discussion is how the mothers are behind a lot of these businesses or at least occupy a really um, important role in these businesses. And to me, when I was growing up before, I guess the, the term serial entrepreneur is so much in vogue. I feel like my mother was starting a business after business after business. And um, she also started a fleet of jeepney company. <laughs> um, in the Philippines, jeepneys are a form of public transport. And she started that along with the store. And um, I was wondering, and, and she was received by the community in, in such a way that they consider her as, as this petite woman, but you cannot mess with her because she goes under you know, the chassis of a jeepney and also she welds because everyone sees her welding and also manages the store at the same time. So I was wondering how did the community see your mothers? And was it, and, and as a child, as, as, a, as a child, how did you see that connection between your own mother and a public figure, if you may? Wow, that's a beautiful question, Maria. Uh, and I feel like my mom would totally love to hang out with your mom. <laughs> I feel like they would just be badasses together. Um, oh yeah, my mom is at the central core of it all. I mean, it's very clear to me um, and, you know, I think that's partly why my mom does not have fond memories of the restaurant because, you know, it was my father's business and it's gone, right? Like it was kind of gambled, gambled away of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, it failed. Um, but my mom, you know, still as the, you know, in, in terms of being a single mom, she's a survivor. She is, she is someone who has big visions, I think, for how things um should get done and how she wanted to live her life. I think at the restaurant, she was always putting on probably 10 different hats, right? Like she, and due to gendered roles, like she was front of the house, right? Because that's very gendered to, to have a woman kind of do the kind of talking and, and greeting customers. When in fact, like she was, she should have been chef. Like it was very clear. Like my mom, uh, my dad wasn't a great cook. I mean, I mean, I think that he did okay. Like, you know, but my mom is a really good cook and I, and she would actually cook us family meal. We wouldn't eat the food that we actually served at the restaurant. Um, and so even thinking about that and just kind of like the fact that she was cooking for us, managing front of house, um, doing all these these roles, also sort of taking care of us, you know, trying to keep an eye on us and trying to also, she also did all the paperwork, like all the kind of um, housekeeping of like the bills, et cetera. Like she was, she pretty much put so many different hats on and kept that business running when my father would sometimes disappear for, you know, in Atlantic City for like days, like wouldn't show up to work. And then she would just be like, well, he's not here. Oh, no. like what do we do like call in that uncle like make sure we we need we need to to fill the space to have someone cook and so I think my mom had a lot on her shoulders and I unfortunately the restaurant's not in um in our memory the same right my brother and I have really fond memories of that magical place but my mom saw it as this like like get me out of here <laughs> like I want it to close I don't want this life and so yeah, I, I think, and, and now that she's a postal worker, I feel like she finally has a kind of more stable job. And I, I think that um, a lot of it had to do with survival. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think with survival comes a lot of ferocity. That's and cool. so she is fierce um, and kind of like your mom, um, just kind of, mm -hmm. she, she's, she wields, uh, she, doesn't, she doesn't necessarily weld, but she's like wielding yeah. some sort of fire stick, I don't know, too, in a way, but um, yeah. In terms of, yeah, mothers, I think my mother was definitely like always working and from like night, like day double shift sometimes. So, and the way she cares for like the people that work there and also like first time customer strangers, yeah. she kind of became like a mother of not my own mother, but also a mother figure to other people in the cafe. And that like makes me really admirable in that sense because it's just mm -hmm. that you you sense that the care she gives is it's not just family, but it's like it's all over because the restaurant kind of brings together a new a, a home setting. 
so it is like like really touching to see that I guess <laughs> I, don't, I like yeah. that because she becomes very maternal to everyone not yeah. just not just the immediate family mm -hmm. yeah. yeah my mother was, was she, especially back in the days she was a little bit much more quiet and so and so she but she actually was in the back of the house and she was kind of the engine that would kind of drive the restaurant through and my dad because my dad could speak fluent English and so because of that and my mom didn't really have a ton of interest in in um in, in like you know conversing with with everyone and so she was she was kind of in like just stoically in the background get <laughs> doing doing all the heavy lifting really um and and then and my and for my dad he would kind of do the front of the house stuff and he would kind of go back and forth but um but it was because for my mom the way like her approach to it was was a bit different in the sense that she was like that was like like a means to an end and she definitely kind of would probably echo your mom's feelings jane where she she has like does not have fond memories of the restaurant um and and a lot of that is surrounded by her guilt of feeling like that she wasn't able to be around more for us um for my brother and i and and so she she always like you know whenever we start talking about it and reminiscing she's like why are you talking about that i don't want to talk about that mm -hmm. like i just think about you kids eating kids eating kids eating in the back eating in the back with cardboard boxes and stuff like that and it doesn't make me feel good and um whereas i you know have my brother and i have like very fond memories of those things and and like and so she, like her if she had spare moments whenever she did have them she would you know tend be tending to us so it was just you know back and forth for her uh, between those two those two worlds and um and i think it was very like very difficult on her just like her you know feelings as a mother towards her kids like I feel like I should be doing more um when you know we were as happy as could be like I went back to visit uh the town in Alaska it was called Kotzebue um and I went back to visit because I have like very fond memories of it and um my mom was really like why are you going back there <laughs> like why are you going back and I was like I want to go back and see what it's like because it's been years and so um uh so it's like a very different different kind of perspective on those we do have questions now yeah, coming questions. from our chat and i'm hearing an echo um okay so we have one from kathy most kids have no idea what their parents do for work do you think you're do you think experiencing your parents' work up close impacted your relationship with them? Once again. Uh, big time. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, I don't know. I feel like there is such a close, like a deep closeness that's both beautiful and also um, maybe a little too close um, in kind of being around your parents and their work at all times because you know, sometimes my mom would get frustrated, right, by uh, a really, like, racist customer. I mean, there, like, as many times as I had wonderful customers, there was always, you know, that a few that would just, like, be frustrated by my mom's accent or, or whatnot. And I, I think watching my mom go through that, um, having, wanting so badly to stand up for her, like, there's, you see, I feel like I saw my mom as, as, as human as, as it possible like she wasn't mom with a capital m at the restaurant right like she also was you know you know gin and i think that in many ways like because i saw how customers treated her both positive and, and negative like i was very hyper aware that my mom was not my just my mom like she was um so many other things to other people um you know a community member like she you know also just seeing my mom like have all these wonderful friends come in at the restaurant and um, people who got her, you know, has her back, you know, like, and when she went to like ESL night school, like her, her classmates would come in and create these relationships. Um, and that was so beautiful, I think, to see, um, to see my mom be someone beyond, you know, a caretaker for me. 
Um, but also it was really hard. I think when I saw her struggle and saw her really have a, a difficult time with my father, of course, but also with, you know, some really frustrating customers and just like days that were just really rough. And I think that to me, it, it made me empathize with her on such a deep level that, um, you know, in my poetry, like I write a lot of persona poems, uh, poems in her voice. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with how close I felt to her tied to the, the restaurant life, um, because I felt like literally an extension of her oftentimes. I would follow her around kind of like a little bumblebee and it would annoy her. Um, but I just wanted to be near her at, her at all times, both as kind of wanting to learn from her, but also to protect her. Like there was, you know, I, I felt like I grew up a little, I, I feel like I matured a lot, I think actually as a restaurant baby, um, maybe faster than some of the other kids in my class, because I was just very aware of, of the exterior world coming into my interior world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, growing up at least very exposed to my parents' work, mostly my mom, I feel there was this even sense of kinship between her and I because, or her and, and my siblings, because we actually helped in the store. And if there's a problem, usually other parents would tend to shield their kids from the problems. She tried, but we did see it, you know, happening, unfolding. We did see customers being rowdy when it's, you know, when somebody's had too much to drink, sometimes, you know, they go to the store and um, yeah, it, it kind of builds a certain persona as a kid that you also have to, you could see sometimes the world that usually gets shielded from children. What was your experience like in that case, um, Eddie? Um, for me, I, I, I felt like it instilled like a kind of a very deep appreciation um, of just watching them work so hard all the time watching you know they're they come in and they're exhausted you know and like it's they don't really have any days off to to rest and kind of recharge like there are no real weekends and and so and seeing that exhaustion um i think it just made me feel kind of, it, there was a sense of awe in it as well which i'm sure they didn't really feel <laughs> at the time but for me as a kid like and like and seeing them kind of navigate those those um instances with kind of unruly customers or you know um or people in the community who were maybe less accepting of, of things that that watching them kind of interact in those spaces um like felt, felt kind of very empowering to see because because especially you know in the 80s you're not seeing a lot of you know Asian people just kind of out in the public sphere a lot so my parents became kind of it and like and other family members and stuff they became the people that that you know the representation that you're looking for because you weren't seeing it anywhere else really um and so it had a, a big kind of impact I think and feeling like a sense of like creating space for yourself and, and creating a sense of belonging. Yeah. Okay, another question here. Um, as children, you were quite independent, having to occupy yourselves. Do you think there is a connection between that and the career you have chosen as artists? Happy to work, wait, happy to work? solo as an artist practitioner. Tom, photography is very <laughs> individual. What do you think of that? I think um, there is a definite connection. Well, growing up, I, they were always telling us to like get out of the restaurant. So going towards arts was like some sort of, a, as cheesy it sounds, it's like an escape of some sort to like really get out. but. Um, and I, but then you remember where you're coming from. So you do appreciate all the things that they've done and how they brought you here. But it's, it also, cause working with photo, you do work alone a lot of times, just looking at your own images. 
but that's why I still sometimes I'm still I I am in the cafe sometimes to off balance that so I could talk to people because mm. I do miss like interaction with like problem solving together with people so I think growing up at restaurants you're always around people so you miss that bouncing back and forth of like checking in and checking out if people are okay and stuff like that so I think I don't know if they all connected but I, I think like yeah growing up at restaurants you, I, I do seek like to be social and to be with other people and like yeah does that make sense I don't know the answer to that question yeah no I feel very similarly that um I feel like restaurant life is so social um you're not alone you're not alone at all I mean you're oh. surrounded by people by sound by smell by like it's actually a whirlwind it's it's I don't realize how loud it is how full it is until you know I haven't been in restaurants because of COVID for a while and then you go out to eat and you're like whoa this is overwhelming um and I think that as an artist there is this kind of feeling like like I always want to connect with other artists and and kind of you know co-create and um share and there is such a deep sense of community Eddie and I met us met each other through Kundiman which is an Asian American literary organization like just kind of finding uh always trying to find that that connection with other artists and like you were saying tom i feel like there is um as much as i think uh the restaurants or the other shops and eddie was mentioning this too like other businesses like um relying on other businesses like um sharing or swapping food um you know with other businesses um you know sometimes they'll watch you watch you for a little bit and you know you know babysit of sorts and so I feel that way about art too I feel like there's a lot of shared resources and mm -hmm. being very open to that as part of my practice is something that I, I really value I, I have a hard time actually thinking about really truly writing alone these days though I may draft things alone I know that what I'm writing has is due to a lot of conversations I've had and I think that that seems really kind of uh, central, uh, you know, for me. And I think that, you know, my brother is incredibly creative himself and I, you know, and as such a storyteller. And so like thinks very visually in particular, um, you know, as a, as a the designer, just thinking about kind of design. And I think a lot of growing up in a restaurant led to, I think just really different really sensory ways of seeing the the world it's like I I don't know maybe this is it's like a, it's like science it's like it's a hypothesis like how many restaurant babies are actually you know what I mean like artists like maybe we're maybe we could be at like 75 percent I don't know actually what I don't maybe this is I am not a scientist clearly or a researcher I'm just like I don't know how to do this but it'd be curious I'd be curious to see how many people grew up like in restaurants or like family businesses that end up actually in the the arts and the humanities um yeah and uh yeah I don't know if Eddie if you want to add but I think I also see a there's also the Q&A box and I, I think I see mm -hmm. one there would you like to answer that question first Eddie before I move on to the um, Q&A I mean I feel like there's a very strong uh correlation because I think, and it's, I think it like, like uh, Tom and Jane have been talking about, it's that kind of um, balance between kind of being the times of being alone and that social and that kind of need to be social as well. And, and like, and I feel like to echo Jane's point, I think that I'm most productive as a writer when, um, when I'm having those kind of conversations mm -hmm. regularly. And, and like, it, it kind of gets, the idea is going a little bit more and it gets me kind of digging a little bit deeper than maybe I normally would on my own. At the same time, I do kind of, I do appreciate those moments and spaces to myself to kind of try to like, you know, to try to make sense of those, of, of those thoughts. And, um, and so I, I think that that being, uh, you know, in a situation where I had to do that when I was a kid, I think is, is kind of as I feel like it served me well not just actually as as like a writer but as as a person in general because I felt like it taught me to be able to kind of be alone with myself mm -hmm. um and I think that that's not maybe the, always like the kind of 
the easiest thing for people to do. Um, and so uh, I, I feel like it was a very valuable experience and definitely had, had that, that strong impact on me. We have this question from um, our Q&A box. So it's from Michelle, LOL. This might be an oddball <laughs> question, but if you could give your restaurant baby childhood self a dish or a drink, maybe from the restaurant you grew up in, or maybe not, what would it be? That's such a Michelle Penulosa <laughs> question. I love it. Anyone want to start us off? And yeah, Maria, you should answer this question too. Um, well, we sold, uh, I guess, prepacked food. If I were going to give my young self something um, from this store, it would be unlimited supply of dried squid because I really miss that now. I used that was my job in the weekends. We, my mom would buy a whole from wholes, uh, would buy wholesale these dried squid. I would have to repack them in tiny, tiny packets to sell them individually. So I would love some dried squid right now. I love it. Michelle says, yes, pass it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Eddie? Um, I would, my, my, my grandfather did shaved ice. So that has a really fond memory. And in Taiwan, it's like hot. So mm. I would like want that on a hot, hot day. <laughs> So probably like shaved ice with like different toppings on top, like mangoes, tapioca, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. There was um, actually what like I sometimes still think about this. Um, there was one night um, when my when my dad had just finished, uh, he would like pre cook some of like like a half uh, baked half chicken. And I remember one night he got my brother and I and was like let's eat one of those chickens <laughs> so, <laughs> and so he brought it out on a plate and the three of us just devoured it and I, and I never like you know roast chicken wasn't something that we ate growing up because it just wasn't you know in the house but because we had it at the restaurant um they were fresh out of the oven and and I just remember just that experience as a whole was is a very fond memory for me um and so I would maybe gift myself one of those. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's just kind of like, this is becoming like an interesting menu, I think already. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't really eat the, the food that we uh, cooked for customers. We did have really good spare ribs, um, you know, in terms of what was on the menu. Uh, but actually I will choose something that, um, was kind of a, a total treat. My brother and I never really, we didn't grow up with soda or anything. We weren't, we didn't really drink soda. Um, and of course, like at the restaurant, we had this huge, you know, the refrigerator that has all the soft drinks and everything. And we were never really allowed to, to just take one because like my mom was like, oh, it's so sugary, whatever. And the one time my mom would be like, okay, you can take a, a Fanta or like it, it was always grape it was always like grape uh, soda or something. I think it was Fanta uh, or that was, I think orange, but and it was always fruit flavor. It was either orange or grape. And my mom was like, oh, okay, you can take one, but you two have to share it. Um, and we, my brother and I would take, a, this is a really cute memory and one that I cherish. And um, my brother and I, it's, it's so cute. Um, we would take a spoon and we would pour a little bit of soda Fanta and just drink it and then pour a little drink it and it was so slow and because we were just luxuriating in the joy of having this soda that would have to last us a while because we we didn't drink so we weren't allowed to have the the soda cans and so it was just kind of like it was such a joyous memory of just kind of sharing this one can of soda with my brother uh, for hours just kind of just like you know until we got to the last drop and it was like gone and we would maybe have to wait who knows uh, the next time my mom was feeling generous about like giving us sweet stuff um and so I, I would totally totally choose like I think is grape I think it was it was the grape soda uh maybe it was Fanta but just like definitely grape soda like that one I would totally choose that to to kind of give my my younger self <laughs> 
I hope my brother remembers that. It's just a cute memory. It almost feels like too cute. Like, you know, like we're little birds or something like sipping hummingbirds, like sipping nectar, like back and forth of this soda can. Um, and it's very, very Were there any other kind of restrictions that the that you had like my, my mom was always very like she was pretty open about like the type of stuff that we could eat from the restaurant but she was always very strict about when like the fry oil was getting old so like she because they they changed it once a week but <laughs> and I remember one time I was like oh can we have cheeseburgers tonight and she was like the, the oil's like about to be changed tomorrow. Like you can have it tomorrow once the oil is changed, but you can't have it right now. <laughs> you know, there's weird stuff like that. My mom was like very finicky about. I'd love to hear um, Tom's because cafe food is to me, it's like, I have sweet tooth. What would that mm -hmm. mean, Tom? <laughs> um, actually, the, the oil story is definitely similar to now we change our oil twice a week. So, <laughs> so <laughs> um, so the question, wait, what was the question? What we What would you give to your um, restaurant baby self? Is it as a drink or a food for a treat? Oh, I uh, I I said a, sh a shaved ice because my grandma. Oh, that's right, shaved ice. But, but now I'm thinking like other things. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> or sometimes I would just like make my own things because like you're you're gonna be eating this for a long time. Oh, you know how awesome. like when we grew up with like the same drinks or things like that we kind of like try to make things off the menu oh so. I love off the menu cooking I feel like that's the best thing ever because like well that's when you know you really have favorite customers yeah. is that they get the off the menu stuff and the kind of we make it very particular for for them and yeah that, that to me is kind of one of my my favorite memories was just kind of like um, just making sure that whoever we adored had the best, you know, that they, you know, that we did, which we didn't treat everybody that way. I think it's just such a funny, <laughs> right? like I deem you a favorite. And then I would write uh, my, I would write them like, you know, a drawing or like a little poem and staple it to their, to their to-go order. Cause it was always this kind of like, oh, you're special. And so <laughs> it became this thing at the restaurant. I don't know if uh, for you all, but like who got into the inner circle, like of, of the family and how long it took to get into that inner circle. And, you know, at some point, like my brother and I were written into kind of a will. Um, and like when one of our favorite customers passed, like he, his, his wife, when they, they didn't have children, basically we're, we were supposed to get $50 gift cards from um, uh, Toys R Us, like every Christmas. And it's like, you know, stuff like that, like we, people, and people would bring me um, a book every single time they would come. And so I had this library that was building because the customers just wanted to give me books and my brother would get little, you know, like toys and stuff like that. And so it was like, I just, I, I feel, I feel totally spoiled by the customers. I, I don't know, but um, I don't know if, yeah, maybe I was just like, I guess I know we don't have tons of time left, but maybe we can give me end on the customers because I feel like they were they were really kind. I just think about and they still recognize me. Like if I go home, they're like, oh my God, Jane, little baby Jane from the restaurant. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like near 40, you know, and I'm like, you still recognize I, you know, my face. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely like customers that would come in regularly and, and during Chinese New Year's, they'll like give fed pockets and then like some of them would come every year and we're just, it was definitely spoiled and some of that. And they would, sometimes they would come in asking for specific things that specific people would make. Mm -hmm. And that kind of felt special too. It's like, oh, only I can make this for you. Aww. <laughs> It'll be <really> <laughs> sweet. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, that's like some customers get like, not special treatment but just like like you know an extra pump of sugar to their drink because they 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 want sugar or something that's sweet <laughs> <laughs> i think when when i was still when we were still in alaska there was sort of that feeling of like i don't know i i never really got like gifts and stuff but i felt like there were like it was kind of showered with attention in a certain way because mm -hmm. because um because people like my dad and my mom 
and so they were so they were like you know it was their friendships that the that then would kind of be passed down to me like one of my dad's friends would whom my mom really did not like actually but he, he would like kind of randomly get us gifts <laughs> and um like he remember one time he got us like a remote control car or something like that wow. and, <laughs> and yeah it was and and but yeah it was, but like i don't know that there was so much like kind of off menu type stuff because and i think maybe that's because it was like you know the type of restaurant that it was um so i mean there might be you know people might ask for like extra bacon or something like that but um but there was I, but i do think that that for certain people there might be a little extra scoop of, <laughs> of something in there and like you know maybe maybe like you know a battered shrimp falls in with the french fries <laughs> <You know? laughs> i love it it's like a diamonds like the shrimp the <laughs> the battered shrimp <laughs> such a great story our uh, one of i guess the nicest customers that uh, would visit our stores we call him kuya dino kuya is big brother and he used to teach the local um public school and he used to teach math and so when we do change uh when he pays he would say things like okay so now i gave you 10 pesos for uh two peso whatever and so how much change would I get? So it's, it's she, he tries to do a math lesson with me and my brother at the store because it's, you know, it's like the thing he does. And uh, we just remember that it's kind of like, oh, okay, we're being tested in our own home, okay? <laughs> at the <laughs> store, we're already working. But um, yeah, we had fond memories of, of uh, Cuyadino. And I think to this day, I think he still teaches. Well, thanks everyone for that um, really wonderful discussion. Um, unfortunately, we do not have much time left. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you, Jane. And everyone who joined us today, everyone who registered and also uh, logged on and shared and asked questions. Um, we, we really appreciate you participating today, uh, today's panel. Um, I also would like to thank Kathy Tycholis, who's um, behind the scenes, um, helping out with, a, with putting together this event. And uh, just to remind everyone that the exhibition is still going on, Nourish is still going until April 3rd. So that's just a few weeks away. If you haven't visited, um, there's still time. And uh, if you want to revisit, uh, thank you for coming and please come again. Um, we have another uh, another panel discussion coming up on Saturday, and it's from kitchens to cities, another Nourish panel discussion. That would be another interesting conversation. It's between um, Alexander Gale, who is a restaurant critic, Henry Yu, um, a historian, and also Bo Lee, who is a chef and a restaurant owner. And they will talk about um, restaurant culture in Vancouver and Richmond. So I would be, I would be tuning into that one. Um, again, thanks to everyone, to our panelists and to our uh, participants. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Thank Maria. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. So fun. <laughs> I, like we're just <laughs> I know I, only I feel like I wish our, our kind of uh, child selves could all hang out I I didn't have friends so I it would it would have been so cool to hang out with like baby Tom and baby Eddie and baby Maria just kind of just creating our like little crew and just like roaming around and you know causing trouble. I just think it's so cute. <laughs> Throwing eggs. <laughs> Throwing eggs and eating shaped ice and right. you know, you know, I love it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks everyone. <laughs>